Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the British School at Rome. It's a great pleasure to see everybody here this evening for this event in our Fragments Meeting Architecture 3 programme of lectures and exhibitions. Uh, I'd like to start, since uh, some of the people here haven't followed all of the programme that we're doing, just with a word or two about um, what this programme is about. The British School at Rome has throughout its history been absolutely committed to the study of architecture as well as the visual arts and humanities. Architecture is a critical linkage for us between those subjects. It's a, uh, a study of space, it's a study of the way in which we live together as well. It has ramifications for antiquity, it has clear ramifications for the contemporary world. Uh, some of you are studying the topography of this city uh, in its ancient form and you're looking at the spaces within which people operated and that is what architecture is about. It's an extraordinary uh, combination of practice and social science. Uh, we find it extremely stimulating. For us, uh, architecture also opens the opportunity for us to reflect upon some of the most challenging issues of the contemporary world. Uh, repeatedly over the years that I've been involved in the British School at Rome, uh, with the collaboration and the excellent curation of Marina Engel, we've been able to put on a series of programmes which have directly uh, tackled major issues such as uh, urbanism uh, and the way in which we manage urbanism in developed societies, the way in which we uh, develop and approach urbanism in societies such as India, where the combination of the huge mega cities that are growing and the challenges of poverty coexist and have to coexist alongside architectural solutions. And of late, we've been looking very much at the way in which architecture uh, is as it were a metaphor for the creative process, that the way that architecture operates gives us hints as to how other practices, artistic and social scientific, uh, can exist, coexist and collaborate. In the course of this third uh, iteration of the Meeting Architecture series on fragments, we've been particularly interested in looking at the way that emotions are stirred, memories are evoked and ideologies are shaped by buildings ruins and their contents. And this concentration has permitted us to enter into some very contested territory, some very difficult territory, where architecture is the trace of, the marker of, and we hope sometimes the resolution of some of the most intractable conflicts of our time. Just a few days ago, we were listening to the former uh, Assistant Director uh, um, of Culture at UNESCO, Francesco Banderin, talking about uh, the impact of civil war and strife on architecture and the place of UNESCO and other organisations in thinking about the protection of cultural heritage. Today we have a lecture and an exhibition uh, that bring some of these great themes, these grand conflicts, into a, deep, into a very sharp focus through a deeply personal lens. But that turning it inwards by no means excludes uh, the bigger theme. And it's simply a different way of looking at hugely complex and difficult challenges and questions. And I'm absolutely delighted that we have Dor Getz with us tonight. I'm very grateful to him for all the work uh, involved in putting on this exhibition. Uh, and I look forward very much to the lecture that he will give us about the exhibition and then also the conversation that we'll have. Uh, but we've also been immensely fortunate throughout this programme to have many uh, of our colleagues and friends in Rome uh, follow and support us. And so without further ado, I'm going to pass to Ludovico, uh, who will be able to introduce Dorgetz and talk a little bit more, more about Dorgetz's practice. So thank you all. Buongiorno, eh, anzi buonasera, benvenuti a, a, questa, a questo incontro con Dorghese, eh, un artista eh, molto molto impegnato che eh, ha un lavoro estremamente articolato e che in questo caso viene presentato in, eh, sotto due forme, la forma del video appunto che si intitola 40 Days, 40 giorni, 
e la forma invece di questa serie di scanograms che vediamo eh, qui all'ingresso e che sono in qualche modo legati da un discorso, da un processo che prende eh, forma e si struttura intorno a una vicenda familiare vissuta dall'artista. Eh, L'artista appunto ha, eh, è di origine eh, tunisina e eh, per parte di padre, tunisino ebreo, e um, per parte di madre una ebrea cristiana. E, uh, nasce a Gerusalemme, d'Orghese, e uh, la sua vicenda personale, familiare, appunto prende spunto, anche in qualche modo l'origine di questo lavoro, prende spunto dalla storia di suo nonno, eh, Jacob Bonayer, morto nel 2011, eh, che eh, secondo la, la credenza dei cristiani ortodossi, per 40 giorni la sua anima vaga in cielo fino ad essere ricevuta appunto in, eh, in cielo. Quindi per questi 40 giorni dopo la morte sostanzialmente l'anima del, del defunto, appunto Jacob Monayer, eh, si trova in uno stato diciamo sostanzialmente di limbo tra la terra appunto, e il cielo. E, mh, questa vicenda eh, parte da, dalla sua morte e in particolare da dal luogo in cui appunto il nonno è stato seppellito, così come buona parte della famiglia dell'artista, che è una, il cimitero cristiano palestinese di Lod, una cittadina tra Tel Aviv e Gerusalemme. E questo cimitero, che è un cimitero eh, dove c'è un certo numero di tombe di, della comunità cristiana palestinese, è stato vandalizzato più volte nel corso degli anni in maniera anche molto, molto pesante, molto, molto violenta e eh, nel video appunto Ghez racconta la, la distruzione di questo cimitero e eh, riflette su questa mh, problematica di questa minoranza che siamo palestinese all'Od che evidentemente appunto è una minoranza come dire scomoda l'installazione invece che vedete eh, realizzata eh, appunto dall'artista attraverso un procedimento particolare che lui definisce scanograms ehm, parte da, da un, da, del materiale che riguarda, che riguarda appunto la la scoperta da parte eh, della famiglia di Ghez eh, di, di questi atti vandalici nel, nel cimitero. Eh, per andarli a denunciare alla polizia, eh, l'artista e il nonno hanno fatto insieme una serie di fotografie che poi sono state eh, restituite alla famiglia della polizia e eh, lasciate appunto dalla nonna in un cassetto della cucina per molto tempo. Dopo un certo numero di, un certo numero di diciamo di di giorni, anzi di settimane, eh, le foto sono state ri recuperate, ritrovate e eh, in qualche maniera appunto si è constatato che queste fotografie erano state eh, danneggiate dall'umidità, quindi in qualche modo c'è stata questa sorta di eh, rispecchiamento tra il danno realizzato appunto dai vandali e il danno eh, causato dall'umidità dall su queste fotografie che poi sono state appunto dall'artista scannerizzate e presentate in questa, in questa forma che vedete. Quindi il lavoro è un lavoro legato appunto a, a una vicenda evidentemente politica, anche di, di minoranza, eh, e che parte come anche eh, si evince dal titolo della rassegna da un concetto legato al frammento, appunto alla distruzione di queste fotografie, la distruzione delle tombe, quindi l'idea di questo frammento che in qualche modo viene, eh, come dire, subisce un, un processo eh, legato al tempo ma anche legato alla violenza umana e quindi in qualche modo diventa eh, esso stesso una storia da raccontare. La storia ci verrà raccontata eh, in maniera molto più precisa e molto più articolata di quanto l'abbia fatto, fatto io in questa breve introduzione dall'artista in, eh, in questo talk che adesso andremo ad ascoltare. E, che sicuramente ci porterà appunto all'interno del lavoro di Dorghez che ha eh, esposto in molti musei del mondo, ha, fatto, ha realizzato più di 26 personali in istituzioni del mondo molto prestigiose, l'ICA di Londra, il Rose Art Museum di Boston, il Maxi a Roma, il Palais di Tokyo di Parigi e tante altre. So, uh, thank you for being here, o uh, excellent guest. Uh, we are now uh, introducing the work and the show by Dorghez, uh, Israeli artist, 
uh, that is here to, to present two works that are related on this title, 40 Days. The title is related to the uh, a kind of legend, or uh, it's not a legend actually, it's, it's, it's a fate in a way, uh, that the, the Orthodox Christians believe that the soul of a person will stay for 40 days between, between earth and, and the sky uh, before being accepted in, in the, of course, in, in the, well, how do you say, in the heaven, heaven yes, I mean, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And so uh, the the work is divided in two parts. There's a video, and there's there are a series of scanograms. And the, the history of the video is related also to the history of, of the of the um, photographs that you are seeing in the scanograms series. And is uh, about uh, an act of vandalism perpetuated by uh, unknown people. Uh, in the cemetery of uh, um, this little city between uh, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem called Lod. Uh, and uh, this, this band, act of vandalism was denunciated by, by the artist and by his grandfather. And uh, they went to the police, they took some pictures about this act of vandalism, and then the, and then the pictures were, were um, put in a grove by by uh, the, the grandmother of the artist and then forgotten for some time. And then when they take it out, they saw that the, the pictures were damaged by humidity. And so it's, uh, the idea is a, a also is about a relation between the fragments of the, of the grave and the fragment of the photo of the picture. And all the fragments are in a way uh, related to this idea of, um, of uh, how uh, an act of vandalism could become a story, and how a story could become also a work, an artwork. So it's a process, it's an ongoing process that I think Dorges will, will introduce to us in a, in a perfect and in a very precise way, much more than I did now with this short introduction. Thank you to everyone to listen, and welcome Dorges. I'm not sure I'll do a better job than you two, but uh, thank you for this introduction. And uh, thank you to British School, the entire team, and especially to Marina. Uh, I think we exchanged more emails than I exchanged with any other curator in the history of my career. So I will <laughs> terribly many? miss you. How many? Oh, it's thousands. Uh, thousands. Honestly, it's thousands, yes. Okay. Yeah, well, yes, sure. We should do like another lecture in two years or something and see. Uh, and thank you for uh, coming here. I know uh, uh, it's a sunny day and uh, I have a competition. Um, so I was thinking what, I mean, how do I relate to this uh, subject, to this great program that uh, Marina is curating? And um, I think that the word that I thought about the most was uh, absent. Or, uh, do you say absent or abs Do you have another absent? Let's try and see if it works with the word absent. Um, because it's actually related to a lot of uh, aspects of uh, my work. I will uh, start with uh, a video work. This is just a teaser. I will start with a video work. Uh, I think it's my first video. Um, named Samira. And uh, Samira is a Palestinian name, uh, Arab. She's uh, also my cousin. It's a very simple work. and. Uh, I'm just giving you the information because we're not from uh, uh, the Middle East. Uh, Mira, which you will see in the video, is actually a Jewish name, and Samira is an Arab name. That's, I think, the only information we need to know about this video. Let's see, like seven minutes, and then we'll talk about Absam. Please forgive the quality because uh, we didn't uh, adjust the beamer. I'm a student of the Victoria, one year of the day, I'm a young and I'm a young man. I'm a young man, 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 I'm a young man
Sorry, this is something you should never do to an artist, stop his work in the middle, but it's mine. <laughs> um, just a second. Okay. So I think this work, in a way, really describes the, the community that comes from which you already presented, which are the Christian and Palestinian uh, in Israel. We are in a way a minority within a minority, because uh, obviously the Palestinians that live in Israel, not in Palestine, not to confuse, are a minority because there is a majority of Jewish population, but within this population we are, the Christians are a minority within a minority. And I think that in my work it becomes the kind of, kind of, I would say even a physical metaphor, because it has many shapes and forms and obviously the project 40 days also uh, relate to that. But I wouldn't say that my work is about the Middle East, I wouldn't say that my work is about the Christian uh, Palestinian or about the history of uh, our land, even though it, there are many facts that are true in the work itself. I would say that this is about a very human condition of being a minority. I truly believe that we are all in different phases in our lives, or different situations and contexts, experiencing the experience of being a minority. I mean, being a woman is being a minority, being poor is being a minority, being un uneducated can be uh, being a minority. So we can look at numbers, which is the typical way of looking at minorities, but this is only one factor. So when I talk about, when I show this video uh, of uh, Samira, how they ask her to take just one letter and then she can pass as uh, Jewish, so the customer won't complain. This is actually really reflecting the, the situation of, uh, of this minority in uh, Israel, because if you understand Hebrew and you hear her speaking, she doesn't have any accent, she talks like a perfect uh, Hebrew. It's not only perfect, it's even posh Hebrew, that is very nice to the ear, very round. And uh, only the name actually uh, tell the customer that she's uh, actually uh, uh, Arab. And uh, obviously my work also deals with uh, stereotypes or meta-narratives. And in a way people always ask me, are you Israeli? Like you describe me as Israeli. And I always say, well, I come from Israel. <laughs> You're not? Well, it's, uh, it's a delicate question, it depends on the context. When I'm with my Palestinian family, I feel Israeli. When I'm with my Israeli Jewish family, I feel Palestinian. So, uh, <laughs> I would say I'm 100% Israeli and Jewish, and 100% Christian and uh, Palestinian. But people have a lot of difficulties because of obvious reasons to accept uh, both. Uh, I came from uh, Lod, or Lid, in the Arabic, the Arabic name of uh, the city. The city was the Palestinian up to 48, which is the year that uh, Israel was established. And uh, in 48, 98% of the city population were uh, deported to Ramallah, which is now in Palestine, and other countries uh, around the world. If you go today to Lod, you can see among the new buildings, uh, that were built in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. You can see ruins, like the ruins that you can see, that is in this image. But in daylight, they just look like a ruin between houses. You don't really feel any kind of history of the place. And UNESCO actually declared Lod is protected. You are not supposed to touch anything in Lod. Nobody actually uh, protect this in real, real, real life. Nobody really protect these buildings. So in a series of these images that I took at night with long exposure, I kind of tried to imagine how the city uh, looked like. So we have, actually, if you go to the city, only the public uh, 
houses of the Palestinians that remains almost only the public houses because all the private ones were destroyed by the Israeli government. So Israelis are sorry, Palestinians won't claim the uh, the houses back. And <clears throat> it's huge prints. So when you actually walked and saw them in the exhibition, you really felt, oh, there is an old city in Lod. With, and in that sense, they don't reflect the real reality of the city. This is how the city actually looked like today. Very uh, modern, typical city with mask or what you can see here in the center is actually a grave of uh, one of the uh, leaders of the city. They surrounded it with concrete and that's where the market is today because it used to be in the city today, it's just there's nothing around it beside the grave. And at the end of the market day, you could see the, I think the tomatoes over there, they're just burning all the garbage next to the grave. Which leads me to another kind of ruin or another kind of destruction, uh, which is the 40 days project, which I think that you explained it in Italian, how the process and everything, right? A little bit. A little bit. Maybe you can go a bit. Okay, I, w I won't go too much into details, but there are scanograms, and people ask me what are scanograms, what is this technique. So I work with scanners like you work with cameras. I have three different cameras or three different scanners, and I take images, like some of them like those I took myself, but some of them are historical image. And I try to emphasize, uh, like in the ruins, to emphasize the history of the photograph as an object, not just to show the image, but also to show what happened to the image itself with time. This is very dramatic what happened to the image because they were kept, you did say that I think, they were kept in the, in the kitchen, but sometimes it's very minor things that happen to a photograph. We are all very much obsessed, I think, in general as society, with reservation. Like if we see a ruin, we said, what can we do with this ruin? If we see somebody's getting old, how can it look younger? I mean, and that's what we do to everything, uh, to our faces, to our ruins, to, uh, to everything around us. And in a way, scan, the, the, the technique of scanning and rebuilding the image to emphasize the tears, the faults, and the thing, the, the, what time left is going against, uh, going against the grain, going against what we usually accept from uh, uh, from looking at archival photographs. And if you saw the video, I think Marina, when we saw it on the big screen, she was like, she was doing like what, what everybody, every curator is doing, like seeing my grandmother just tearing them apart. It's like, oh, I can't see it. Because this is the story of this object. This is, it's not only about the photograph itself, the image, but also the story of the object and how you emphasize it and tell it. And so it's kind of in a way, it's, uh, maybe to paint with scanners. So, you saw them outside, so we'll go quickly on them. This uh, grave was uh, shot to so, such small pieces that we didn't know actually who was buried there. So, we replaced it with a black marble, and we're not sure who's, who's buried there today, because it's a very old cemetery. This is my great grandmother and grave. And an encounter with my great grandfather. You can see the bones and you can see the suit. Actually, in the prints outside, it's uh, much more, uh, it's much more, it's clearer, I think. Those are images that are not in the exhibition but are a part of the series, the full one. And it's really amazing how the, actually the ruin, the destruction, is framing the inner destruction. I mean, we took the photographs obviously to show it to the police, but then the result is kind of, it's, it's, it's very poetic in that sense. So we have the top, of the, the, the image that was on top of it. We have the, the back side of the photograph, and then it's, in some cases, the emulsion of the photograph itself got mashed. Is that the word, mashed, or just, yes? And 
letting you to another part of uh, of uh, lead of flood, uh, which is uh, private houses. They're very, very different uh, strategy, I would say. If you go to the main boulevards of flood, which is protected by UNESCO, you see this uh, Palestinian architecture. Today they call it IDF uh, boulevards. IDF it's uh, Israel Defense Force boulevards. It used to be the city boulevards, and today it's the IDF. And in these areas of prints, you can just uh, of photographs, you can just see how uh, it looks like a puzzle if you look at the left side, because. When people talk about destruction of uh, the history of this region, they usually go to the back to 48, 65 years ago. But actually, it's an ongoing process of fight between different communities who preserve its own history. So there is no interest of uh, the current government uh, to keep these houses. So it's a very difficult series to show uh, in Israel because you can actually see how the houses are being destroyed one after another. And this series of photographs show the main boulevards in Lod um, part by part, and you can actually see how it happened. This is just the facade of the house, there's nothing behind it. And then you have uh, surreal images of uh, rooms, inner rooms that are just open to the street. Uh, you can see the, the way that they were decorated on the top. This is open to the main street. Now this is the good part of Lot, the ruins and what we just saw. Uh, if you go to the center of the city, you just, because the entire city was destroyed, uh, you just see empty plots, like this. There is one house that is still there, those images are from 2010, it doesn't exist anymore. You can see that people start, if you have a city that is built and there is a space in the middle of the city, of the center of the city, that uh, nobody is using, people start to build like these houses that obviously are not uh, planned, and then the police come and destroy it because it's not legal, and then they rebuild it, and then it's being destroyed again and again. You can see that this house obviously was not planned and was built in different stages. This is a house uh, from uh, the Palestinian city that is in the process of being destroyed. This is a bit surreal, but this is the center of the city. It's a small city, it's more like a village, and this is the center of the city. And here we have this uh, hovering floor that remains from the house that they ruined. And at the back you can see the new buildings. And if you actually know the history of the place, you know that this market, the gravel uh, is not just a gravel in this footprint. What looks like footprint is actually uh, where a house used to be. And I'm jumping between projects. And talking about uh, accent and how you uh, actually relate to it uh, through history and through art, um, when you think about the land of Israel, I don't know how many of you have uh, uh, been there, but it's very green today, it's full with pine trees, uh, and you think this is the natural landscape of the country, but actually it's not. They were uh, planted by the European Jews that came to the Middle East. They look at the landscape, they thought it's empty because there are no trees, they come from European tradition. So they start planting, and the entire state of Israel, from the north to the south, is full with these trees. And yes, in first glance, it looks beautiful, it looks green, it looks uh, very European, but in fact, uh, this, uh, this kind of tree doesn't really uh, belong in this uh, region. And the, um, how would I put it? The green impact of it is... Uh, um, is, is, is terrible. I will explain, I will show it uh, through images. But just to explain these images, 
like uh, many of uh, my project, it started from uh, archival images. This is the only images that we have of uh, a group of uh, uh, people that worked at the beginning of the 50s in a company that named The Nation Grows. It's a, a, a company of the state. And their job in 1950 was to take all the, the, all the fields of the Palestinians that don't live there anymore, the 750,000 Palestinians that don't live there anymore, and uh, uh, to, uh, to work in that land, to, to make some profit. So ironically, uh, these images were, look, it looks like Hebrew Zionist uh, workers. Actually, in this company, you had both Arab uh, Jewish that came from our countries and Palestinians that uh, were forced or were asked to work in their own land that was not, no longer uh, their own, uh, their land. So, usually when we talk about the conflict, we, talk, we, we see different images of uh, different communities, but here they are mixed together. So, it started with these images of, this, of the nation groves. And then in a series of, uh, under the same project, in a series of uh, very Becher style uh, uh, images, which is a take off on them. <laughs> um, I took uh, uh, 16 images of playground in Israel that are in this artificial, so-called artificial, not natu natural forest, uh, playground that are actually made by the same trees. So in a way, like the scanograms of 40 days, which is a destruction within a destruction here, it's artificial within artificial, it's pine within pines. And it, the aesthetic is, it's an Israeli company, the design of the aesthetic is also uh, very weird because it looks like a settlement or it looks like uh, uh, when you do this kind of uh, roof, I don't know how to, to describe it, but it's for actually for snow and it, it's, not, it's not a very snowy country. <laughs> not really. Not really. So we have a few close-ups. And it looks like watchtowers, very military. And the only iron uh, instrument that it's the first forest that is there is actually in the shape of a cactus fruit, which is uh, a native to, ironically, it doesn't make it's not from wood, but it's native uh, to uh, this region. And that's me to a work that maybe some of you saw at Maxi, uh, an exhibition. It's two Palestinian riders going through the forest on horses. Uh, and I feel that today, if we really want to talk about uh, <laughs> desert in Israel or emptiness, uh, this is the real desert in Israel because what the pine trees do, their needles go on the field, on the ground, and they just suffocate anything that is natural. So today the entire land of Israel is, is green, but nothing can grow underneath it, which is a great metaphor to what they did. Uh, and it's a picnic area, but you have this ghost going through the forest from the uh, nearby uh, Palestinian uh, villages. This is how it was uh, uh, shown in, uh, in Lightbox. And this is how the uh, images that uh, I showed at the beginning were shown in uh, the Rose Art Museum in Boston. I will end with some exhibition views. So the entire aesthetic also relates to my region, also relates to the Greek Orthodox uh, churches, the color scale, and the way it was presented. And then there were like kind of these boots to see, uh, these very intimate uh, videos. This is another project I won't get into right now. I don't know how I am with time. I can go on. Can I? Are you sure? Yes, yes, yes. Yes? Okay. So I will go on to another project. <laughs>
which is the CPA, the Christian and Palestinian Archive. This is a project I started in uh, 2009. It's an ongoing project of collecting images uh, from all around the Middle East of the Christian uh, Palestinians. It started from my own family photos, and today it includes thousands of uh, images from Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, but also from Brazil, from uh, different countries in Europe. And uh, now there is an open call in uh, New York. This is how the archive works. And actually, this is uh, an exhibition I did. Uh, this work was shown at Nismo but uh, uh, this is an exhibition I did at the Tvil Gallery in Tel Aviv, in Jaffa. Uh, it was the first time I dedicated the show only for uh, uh, the archive. Uh, and what you see is actually scanners from the archive, not the archive uh, uh, itself, naturally. So the, what I show you the first series, and I will end with this series, from the Christian Palestinian Archive, and it's how it started for family photos that we found under my grandfather's uh, side of the bed. We call it, I call it Scanogram 1. It starts with this image of uh, Georgette, which is uh, Samira, my grandmother's eldest. Uh, uh, my cousin is Samira after my grandmother, uh, and this is her uh, sister. I think that what's interesting about this image is that it looks like it was taken, I don't know, in Paris or in Berlin in the 30s, but it was actually taken, was taken in uh, Palestine, in uh, Jaffa in 1938. That's what it says down there in Arabic. And there is a friend holding her from the back. Obviously, it's a studio photo. Again, a very rare image that you see both Palestinian and Israeli works together. This is the engineer department of the city of Palestine, of Palestine the city of Jaffa, uh, which is an Arab city mainly, and the city of Tel Aviv. You can obviously identify the Muslims by their uh, kafiyas, and you can see uh, the ones with the suits with the same glasses, the Harry Potter glasses, are the Jews that were in Tel Aviv, because there was only one store, they all have the same glasses. And, uh, and there is uh, one woman sitting in the center. Can you guess who she is? The what? I don't, I can't hear. She's not an engineer, it's the 40s. Uh, she's the wife of the British uh, manager that sits on the left. Um, obviously, it was the British uh, mandate period, so they run the show. Um, there are some that claim... Is, it, is that being rec recorded? Maybe we'll edit it out, but there are people that claim that Maybe it would have been better if they stayed. I think Israel and Palestine is the only place that actually missed the British. And, sorry. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, it's a rare image in the sense that uh, really you can see both Arab and Jewish uh, population uh, uh, works together. This is Samira's brother. Uh, in the center of uh, Jaffa and near the family uh, estate, very dandy. This is Jacob, my grandfather, on a horse, killing a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone should write a PhD just on that image. I mean, uh, I guess it's very influential by the Westerns that were in America back in the days, but I have no idea how the tiger got into the picture. <laughs> But uh, if you know the Arab Image Foundation, uh, we have we exchange uh, uh, information sometimes, and they send me the same format of, photo of uh, studio photographs from uh, from uh, other countries uh, around the Middle East. Not the same tiger, not the same horse, but the same uh, frame. So it's kind of interesting. Also from Jaffa, from the beginning, uh, from uh, the beginning of. Uh, it's 1942. Here you can see the eight girls from the uh, uh, British school. On the left side, it's uh, Samira as a kid, also in Jaffa. 
her brothers before they went to study in uh, Alexandria. So you can feel like there is, uh, it looks like it's a family album of this family that have, uh, let's say, bourgeoisie life in Jaffa. Samira in 1947, my grandmother. And then, when I look in this plastic bags and I collected these images that were not organized in a family album in any way, I found this image. And uh, I, I, I feel it's a very important image. This is uh, actually her wedding day. And uh, the image was kept... Uh, my grandmother, I guess, is not very good in keeping images. But uh, it was kept under the bed, as I said, in plastic bag. And then uh, somebody just, it, it got torn. Somebody just uh, destroyed the image in a very weird uh, way that the, the white part of the paper actually replaced the veil. And, you know, the first question is, as a grandson, I ask her when I discover these images, which I never saw, I ask her, why don't you keep these uh, photographs, don't, why don't you find them? I mean, this is what we do with wedding photographs. We just put them in the living room, in the bedroom. And she didn't really answer. And only when I start to, to go into the history of uh, my city and their private history, I discovered that their wedding happened in Lod. She was originally from Jaffa and then moved to Lod. I will translate, it's a year after uh, 48. Many Palestinians said this, this, this event happened two years after 48. This event happened 20 years after 48. It's like uh, they start counting from this year without even realizing that they do it. And this is actually the first Palestinian wedding after uh, Lod was occupied. And today, because of this wedding, that they call the photographer to take pictures of their wedding, we have uh, the only images uh, that survive today from the period when they live under military uh, government, military regime in, uh, in the city for uh, a, few, uh, a few years. So life in the ghetto, from this 2% of the entire population of the city that remains, the life in the ghetto, they call it ghetto, uh, continues, weddings, baptized, and so on. This is also from the wedding. Here she is uh, pregnant, and uh, I know I said there is no snow in the region, but in 1950, it was the only time documented in history that it snowed, so they called a the photographer to document the event, and this is why we have this, uh, these images. And then, if you look at uh, the city, uh, the Christian Palestinian Archive, if you look at the images, you see many events, like uh, baptized, uh, engagement uh, parties or uh, weddings, uh, obviously because not like today that we're obsessed with photographing everything that, I don't know, we eat and we see. Uh, back then it was obviously events and uh, that's why the archive is full with images of weddings. And here you can see Monir, which we saw back then in uh, Jaffa, in his wedding in Cairo. It's a Greek Orthodox wedding. We see Jacqueline and her wedding Samira's sister is in Amman, in Jordan. Nasser, which we also saw in Jaffa, but is married in uh, Lod, in Lid, with Hilda. And we see Georgette, which we saw 20 years before, in 1938, and this is 1958, uh, with her family in Cyprus. So in a way, the archive, and this is what's unique about this archive, is dressed as a family album, this is the logic of the archive, but in order to create it, uh, I kind of curate all of these images from families that were spread and bring them back together, and it's being arranged like family trees. And in that sense, the archive is actually going against what typically is considered to be uh, state archives or official archives of uh, countries or institutions. And this is how it was uh, presented. This is me actually working on the archive, scanning. It's actually this man, he gave me all of the photographs to scan to the archive, all of his albums, 
And then when we got to, I don't know, the third or the fourth album, he said, you should stop here, this is in London. You should stop here. And I said, why? There are so many great images in the other albums. And he said, well, it's my wife's family, and I just don't like them. <laughs> so he just erased an entire family from the archive. And I guess this is how it works. It's a community project, and it really depends on them how the archive grows. I didn't plan that it will include thousands of images, but that's what happened. And I think I will finish here. Is that a good? I can go on to new projects, but whatever you want. Don't you want to do the questions or? Okay. Do you want to see uh, my latest project? Yes. Okay, so I will jump from this. Such a nice audience. Okay. So my latest project, just ignore this for a second, when I will put an image. Okay. My latest project, uh, the title is The Sick Man of Europe. It was, uh, I launched a project at the ICA in uh, London. It's, uh, it relates also to uh, different communities around the Mediterranean. It started, uh, I'm keeping us with the same geography in Israel, so we won't get too confused, but the project started with uh, talking about Israel, and then the second part was about uh, uh, Turkey, and now I'm filming the third part, which is in Armenia, and it will be a five-part uh, project, all related to different individuals living in the middle, in uh, this uh, region, that suffer from post-traumatic uh, disorder. You say, I think, shell, how do you say, shell? Shell shock. They're all creative people, a painter, an architect, a composer, a writer, and all, all of them, because different words in the region, stop, uh, stop to create. So the first one uh, was about uh, an Israeli soldier that thought in 1973 the biggest war that Israel had with the Arab uh, war, and then uh, because of this he stopped, he stopped painting. He was actually a student, he was invited to Italy to do uh, to do. It's all weird stories, by the way. He was invited to Italy uh, in uh, the 70s uh, to learn how to from the masters how to paint for master paintings, and he didn't come. Uh, the Yom Kippur, the 1972 war started. He went to war. And, uh, his tank was bombed, and uh, he never. Well, it took him 20 years to go back uh, to painting. So, this guy is originally uh, from uh, Tunisia. You know, all Jews, not all, but the majority of the Jewish population in uh, Israel are immigrants, came, coming from different countries, uh, from the diaspora. And um, I'll show you, like, uh, maybe seven minutes of the film. Choose the seven minutes. אני גדלתי בבית עם מעשה ערבי, אנחנו עלינו מתוניס. שפת האם שלי היא תוניסאית ערבית. אנחנו שמענו בבית את עבד אל-ואהב, את חרד אל-אטרש, כל הזמרים המפורסמים הערבים. לא מעולם לא קיבלתי הדרכה או שיעורים. בתור ילד אני גדלתי בסביבה של טבע, כל הזמן הסתובבתי בשדות. ‫התמונתי בפרחים, בציפורים, בדבורים, ‫ורציתי להעביר את זה לנייר. ‫והתחלתי לרשום מהתבוננות. ‫מעולם לא קיבלתי הדרכה. ‫מדי פעם הסתכלתי על אימא שלי, ‫איך היא נהיה חופשי, ‫ככה רושם.
לא היה לי שום מושג על איזה חומרים משתמשים, על איזה חומרים. הציור הראשון זה היה בגואש, העתקתי תמונת נוף על בד, מסגרת שהכנתי בעצמי. לימים, אחרי 25-30 שנה, ראיתי את הציור הזה והוא התפורר לגמרי, הבד התפורר. אח שלי הגדול על הבד במפעל לנייר, הוא היה מביא כל מיני חוברות משם. ומצאתי בין החוברות שהוא הביא כל מיני ציורים של ציירים רוסיים, אמריקאים, אוקיי. ניסיתי כמעט הכל, ניסיתי לשומר פחם, כמובן לא רק פחם מקצועי, אלא פחם ששורפים עץ. גירים צבעוניים, בעיפרון, בדיו. גייסו אותי לצה"ל בשנת 69, נתנו לי שלוש אפשרויות בחירה, שריון, שריון או שריון. כמובן שבחרתי ש... בערב הראשון כשהתגייסתי, אני כולי מבסוט, נפגעתי לתל השומר, ראיתי מה זה צבא, אמרתי, הבנתי את הרעיון, הלכתי הביתה. הגעתי הביתה, הלכתי לבקר את אחותי, נתנה לי כמה גירות, וחזרתי חזרה, שעות מופעות של הלילה, כמובן שאף אחד לא יודע. אמא יקרה, הורים יקרים. אני מרגיש די טוב, רק צריכים להתרגל אותנו. אני מאוד מתגעגע לך. אני מקווה שישלחו אותנו בזמן הקרוב הביתה בשבת, אולי בחגים. כאן אנחנו עובדים הרבה ומריצים אותנו, קמים מוקדם מאוד, ועייפים. תשלחו הרבה מכתבים, כי הם שמים פה מאוד. אמא, אני מאוד 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 מתגעגע הביתה. לאבא, לאחים, ובמיוחד אליי. אני מתגעגע אפילו לציורים שלי. היום ציירתי אותיות בשביל הרב סמל שלנו, וזה במקום לעבוד מטבחים איתי. אני מקווה שהכל בסדר אולי, ושהכל הולך בשורה. תכין לי את כל הבגדים האזרחיים, אל תשכחי. תנסי למצוא בת המכנסיים האחרונים. תכין לי את האוכל שאני אוהב בשבת. אבא, תטפל טוב בגינה. ואל תשכח לטפל גם בציבור. הורים יקרים, חילקו אותנו כבר למחלקות חדשות בקבוצות. התחלתי להכיר חברים חדשים. אמנם קצת מיואש, אבל לא נורא, צריך להתרגל, ואין ברירה. אני לא יודע מתי אני אבוא הביתה, אבל אני מקווה שזה יהיה מהר מהר מהר. אני מאוד מתגעגע לכולם. תכתבי לי הרבה, אפילו אם אני לא יכול לכתוב לך, כי אין זמן. נשיקות חמות, ואל תשכחי לקנות בד, להגביע את המכנסן החומי. <laughs> אמא יקרה, אין לי טיפת זמן, כי אנחנו כבר לומדים בתוך התנאים. בשבוע הבא נתחיל לנהור. אולי אני בא ביום שבוע. כמעט בטוח, אבל אין לדעת בצבא הלאומי. שבעה שבועות של הצמא, זה היה מפיל. וכל כך התגעגעתי הביתה שביקשתי מאמא שלי שתכתוב מכתב שאבא שלי ניקי כאן. אני חושב שהוא מאוד חולה, רציתי שהיא תקצין. ושחררו אותי לכמה שעות. אני לא יודע איך עשיתי מה אמרתי. אני לא מאמין, אני לא מאמין שעשיתי. אז לא עשינו כלום, אז לא עשינו כלום, חיכינו שעד שאין 
I'm living here with the trauma, but uh... <laughs> no, you have to come here. Ah, really? Okay. Yes, of course. I, I will not. <laughs> I'm back. You're back. Yes. Um, maybe I, will, I can ask you some questions if you don't mind. Sure. Sure. Uh, the, your archive, you conceive this as a work or as a kind of frame uh, of works that you are working on. If I consider it as art, is that the question? Yes. What is art? No, 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 no. I no, mean... I know, I know. I will answer seriously. Uh... <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, I would say that uh, I work with the archive as a part of my artistic research. Mm -hmm. But now, it's uh, even though scanograms from the archive are art, but the archive itself is it's not. not. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's not for sale. There is no organization that supports it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't uh, pay for the people that bring the images, or they are not being paid back. It's a community project that is separated from uh, in that sense. So, in, from the archive, you take out the, the uh, uh, images that the, the, only of my family, the images that I own. Ah, okay. If they are not mine, they okay. stay at, at, the, at the project as a part of the project. Okay. And I'm not the only one using the archive. Okay. So it's open for theoreticians, for curators for uh, writers. Uh, so it's an open archive then? It's, it's not online. I hope I will get it's there. It's thousands of images, but people write to me and ask images, and this is okay. how it is. Yes. 
So, I mean, the, the images are, I mean, are stored in, in a computer, of course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about the originals? You don't, take, you don't keep the originals? No, I believe that the photographs have a timeline. And, okay. and uh, we should respect that. Okay, so no originals, only... No, and that's my original face as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how about this, this project we saw? I mean, how do you choose the, the person, the painter? How do I choose them? That's a great question. Well, um, actually, I started the project five years ago, the research. Uh -huh. um, and then I just, uh, I moved from different, through my practice, from the, actually working on the archive from different cities. And I found this kind of, like, uh, narrative that uh -huh. uh, is a narrative that is um, repeating itself uh -huh. in different countries, different communities. Maybe the narrative of modernity, I don't know. But, uh, and then I start collecting stories. I think that what I do, I am a storyteller. Yes, of course. Basically, yes. yes. So I collect so many stories and then I focus on the soldiers. So you go in the place, you collect stories, and then you choose the stories it's, it's that more, are for you more it's significant. Like, yeah, it's not like a mission. Oh, I go to a place and collect mm -hmm. a story. I feel, I feel it's already a part of, of the way I communicate. You shared a few stories with me, maybe you'll be in my new project. Why not? <laughs> it will be possible. Very interesting. Do you have any questions? Have you any questions? I have a question. You said that when you go to uh, Palestine, you feel Jewish, and you go to Israel, you feel Palestine. It's the same happening to me. My father is Romanian, my mother is Hungarian. When I Romanian and Hungarian? Romanian and Hungarian. When I go to Hungary, they tell I'm Romanian. When I go to Romania, they say I'm Hungarian. Despite the fact that Romania takes after father and Hungary takes after mother, so it should be online. And we have been recently asked, we have a working group for women in science, to treat all kinds of diversity, also minority diversity. But this is, of course, on the background of the Syrian immigration to treat the current immigrants. While we have a lot of historic minorities for, because of uh, the history of Europe, for example, Transylvania, was Romania, Hungary, and so on. So what do you think is uh, still place in contemporary for these historic minorities? Thank you. Mm, what a question. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it's everyone. Yes. Everywhere that I go, I have questions from the others when I do lectures. Like, what do you think about the Turkish minority in Berlin? <laughs> what do you think, like, everywhere in Japan? And I think that's because these questions, I think, are relevant everywhere we go, as what you just said, which is a history and uh, a situation that I'm not familiar with. I do think that uh, artists uh, can tell, when I say storyteller, can relate to history and these human conditions in a way that politicians, the media, or historians cannot. So, yes, it is a platform that we can discuss, I think, in a different way, these issues. Did I understand your question? Did I? Yeah, yes, you did. I can add to this the uh, Hungarian pavilion last year in Venice was created by a friend of mine and it was called Sustainable Identities. The idea was how to keep your identity in this context. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. But actually, I think that your work is about minorities, actually. It's about the state of being a minority, which I think we all share. Exactly, as you said yeah. before. Other questions? Alfred the Amanda? No questions? Okay, I will do. He wants to ask something. Yes. Ah. Okay. Um, yes, of course. The director. Uh, he's left. Um, <laughs> can I just ask about uh, your relationship to architecture um, and how important it is, how important the built environment is? Uh, the what environment, sorry? The built environment, how important it is for, you, for your work? The uh, 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 yeah, constructed environment. Uh, to build. Environment. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, obviously, uh, Buildings are either present or absent or fragmentary, and you've shown us all, all three types 
Um, but do you, do you find architecture particularly stimulating, uh, or is it only a backdrop? What is the relationship that you feel with architecture? You understand? I think so. It's a, I think it's a huge What's question. What's the relation about uh, architecture? Is relevant in your work, or is just a landscape? In, well, it's in a way. Um, I actually have to say that I do work with architecture in as a part of my practice. Um, maybe I, I can show you. Later, but I'm working with uh, with uh, a, a group of architects on Lod. Uh, we relate to ourselves as activists, actually. Uh, and we use the images from the archive, from the history of the city, and also the images that I took as something to relate to when we suggest what should we do with this uh, city, because it's very relevant there, because the immediate reaction of the mayor, the current mayor, is that to take all of these ruins and to make a Disneyland out of them, because why leave them as a ruin? And what we try to do is actually to explain that a ruin is already something. And this is something for a mayor. I think for a mayor it's really hard to, to grasp. So we build around it. Actually, we don't offer to build anything. We offer to change the way people move in the city. And we went back to where the market used to be. And all we have to do is to mark roads, different and new roads through the city. So I do think the two are really like, they meet in so many ways. And but Lod was, ex was the place, the city of the Christian Palestinians, right? Yeah, not only. Not only. No. But, yes, but you choose Lod as, as a symbol in a way, in your, in your work. Yeah, I feel, I, I said it before, that I feel that this, it's, this territory is not my family's territory, it's everybody's territory in that sense. And Lod is just an extreme example of something that happens everywhere. Mm -hmm. So Lod is not, a, is not a, a symbol in your, I mean, it's just one of the main places, but it's the one that was related to your family, yes, in a way. Yes, because we so you, you're starting, all the work starts from your story, so yes. from your... Uh, the, the works that I showed today start from mine, yes, but in general, uh, uh, not all of them, yes. Okay. You want to add something more? I'm good. Do you want to? Huh? Okay, we're going to the show, so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you to Doran, it was fantastic. Thank you to the audience. And uh, now the show is open, of course. Thank very you. good, bravissimo. Yes. Fantastic.